Hi, everyone, and welcome to At Katie Correct. Nearly 30 percent of teenagers say they have experienced dating violence, including physical, sexual, or emotional abuse and threats. That's according to a survey from Liz Claiborne and the Family Violence Prevention Fund. Today, we want to take an in-depth look at this very serious and troubling issue. And I'm joined by Jane Randall, a vice president at Liz Claiborne, who's worked extensively on domestic violence projects, as well as Catherine Pierce, who's deputy director of the Justice Department's Office on Violence Against Women. And as always, I'd like to quickly thank the sponsor of our web show, Dove. Thank you both so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Before we actually get to the nitty gritty, because there's so much to talk about um, in terms of why this is happening with greater frequency and why it hasn't gotten more attention. Um, recently, we did a piece on the CBS Evening News mm -hmm. about teenage dating violence. Let's take a look because I think it will give us a lot to talk about. I think I need you, I don't care. For too don't many teenagers, me. this is what dating in America looks like. You make me so pissed. All I remember was landing face first on the floor. Tina, 18, whose appearance we've altered for her safety, says during her six month relationship, the violence spiraled out of control. He got on top of me and he was slapping me back and forth. And he said, next time, do me a favor, call me baby, say that you love me. Raped, beaten, and berated on a regular basis, she stayed with him, believing the abuse was part of a normal relationship. I knew my aunt went through it, so I thought, you know, if she stuck it out with him, with her husband for years, that I should just do the same, keep my mouth shut. When this outgoing 15-year-old, who did not want to be identified, met a cute boy in one of her high school classes, she was smitten. We had the same friends, we liked the same things, so it was, it was good at first. And then what happened? We started to slowly separate because we would fight a lot. He was very controlling. Um, would always know want to know where I am, what I'm doing. It's upsetting to you to even talk about it. Just when you, when someone does that to you, you feel a loss of yourself. The controlling behavior eventually turned violent. Things got so bad, she began skipping classes and avoiding work. Then he started stalking her. I was always locking my doors. Um, we had a house alarm on my house, always turning that on, always looking behind my shoulder to see who it was. These two stories illustrate an alarming trend of escalating violence in teenage relationships. National Teen Dating Abuse Helpline, how can I Calls help you? and online chats to the National Teen Dating Abuse Helpline went up nearly 600 percent from March of 2007 to March of this year. And a recent survey shows even 25 percent of tweens say they've experienced physical violence in their romantic relationships. Stop crying and stay down. They're growing up in a world where violence is everywhere. Now stay down or I will finish you off. Where teens are constantly bombarded with pop culture images objectifying and degrading women. In this generation, it's hard to resist the violence, and it's probably influencing like the number of abusive relationships. Add to that the evolving high-tech frontier. Relentless texting, constant instant messaging, and virtual mind games played out on social networking sites are all becoming tools of choice for abusive teenagers wanting to control their partners. Teens are primarily using technology, and that has changed the dynamics, I think, in terms of the abuse that we're seeing. Tragically for some, this cycle of dating violence can turn deadly. This is a domestic violence related the homicide. 19-year-old Emily Silverstein. 18-year-old girlfriend Carrie Gorman. Gorman. Martinez was convicted for the brutal 2005 murder of Lindsay Ann Burke. In 2003, Lindsay Ann Burke met former Navy seaman Geraldo Martinez at a friend's wedding. For the bubbly 21-year-old, there was an instant attraction. But a few months into the relationship, Lindsay's mother Ann noticed changes in her daughter. She became secretive obsessed with instant messaging and started to distance herself from friends. You saw this change in her behavior and you were really at a loss in terms of what you could do to help her. I did go to several counselors. Not one of them picked up on the warning signs of an abusive relationship. After a tumultuous two years, Lindsay finally left Martinez. On the morning of September 14, 2005, she went to his house to collect her things. 
In a fit of rage, Martinez repeatedly stabbed Lindsay and left her in his bathtub, where she bled to death. Parents don't realize how much a part of their life their children really are until you lose one of them. Anne's grief quickly turned to anger and then action. You're going to learn about dating abuse. And dating a health violence. teacher at a Rhode Island middle school for 23 years, she realized she had never discussed dating violence with her students. I went back to work, looked in the eyes of my eighth grade students and asked myself, so why is it that I'm teaching them about heart disease and substance abuse? but I'm not teaching them about this. For two years, the Burke family pushed for legislation that would require dating violence awareness be taught in middle and high schools in Rhode Island. And I'm hoping that the Lindsay Ann Burke Act will get passed. The act passes. In July 2007, the Lindsay Ann Burke Act was signed act into law. I know at that point, Lindsay was looking down and she was smiling. Destruction of a person is not only physical. Today, Ann Burke is teaching her eighth graders the lessons her daughter, Lindsay, never had. When it makes you feel bad inside, that what, that's what makes it violence. And in high school, students learn to identify red flags. How many of you have seen relationships that look like that? Like jealousy and okay. controlling behavior that are often precursors to violence. What might an incident be with somebody who's possessive or obsessive or overly jealous? Six states have since passed similar legislation, and it's pending in six others. Sometimes this guy I'm seeing spies on my social network pages. Meanwhile, campaigns are using technology to combat the problem, sending out positive messages online. Students are also being enlisted across the country in peer-to-peer -peer programs that help teens understand what makes a healthy relationship. If someone has control over somebody else, what do they have? Power. A program like this helped Tina get away from her abusive boyfriend. Now she wants to help others. I don't want this to keep on happening to young girls or young boys for that matter. So with me opening up and telling them about my story, that they have realized that it is wrong, that they shouldn't be going through it. So Catherine and Jane, obviously this piece gives us a lot to discuss. And the first question, Catherine, I was going to ask you, I, I told the statistic earlier that a third of teens say they've experienced some kind of dating abuse. But 60 percent say they actually know someone who's been in an, in an abusive relationship. Is this problem being taken more seriously by teens and by professionals? I think it is. I think it's being uh, taken more seriously, hopefully, by parents as well. When the Violence Against Women Act passed 15 years ago, we really couldn't even begin to imagine a lot of us, except for Liz Claiborne, of course, <laughs> that uh, this was going on in high schools and middle schools. And I think now school counselors, teachers are far more aware, but we have a lot more to do. And I think we really have to turn to parents more and we need to turn to the teens themselves. We, we know that dating violence, Jane, isn't just physical or sexual. Right. I mean, you could feel the, the terror in that girl's voice, the one who was in silhouette, yep. about, and, and you actually, I felt for her in a way I didn't even feel for her when I first watched that yeah. piece because you can only imagine being afraid 24-7 yeah. of this boy who was harassing slash stalking her. It's terrorism, really, I mean, if you think about it. You know, she doesn't feel safe at home, she doesn't feel safe at school. It's, 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 it's gotten to a point where these kids, you know, they don't know where to turn, they're not turning to adults. That's something we found out when we did our research. They're going to each other. And so it's only responsible to educate the teen population at large about how to help each other since, you know, if they're not going to be comfortable going to you as, as their mom or a teacher or a coach, they need to know how to help each other and how to recognize the signs themselves. Because what happens is people see, okay, now it seems like it's a much more prevalent problem. They're coming forward more. Maybe they're just recognizing it more because we've been doing a better job of socializing the information and letting them understand what a healthy relationship is and what it's not. And it really runs a gamut. I mean, it, it can be a sort of emotional terrorism. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk about the role of technology because I know these incidents have really skyrocketed in recent years. But it can also be overt and, and terrifying physical 
abuse. I was at a dinner, the Joyful Heart Foundation, with Mariska Hargitay, which mm -hmm. she started. And Catherine, you told a story about a situation that to me really illustrated the scope of this problem. Can you just quickly tell us about this incident? It's an incident that occurred many, many years ago in a very upper middle class neighborhood where a young man was very angry with his ex-girlfriend for having told one of her friends who was now dating him, then dating him, that he was abusive to her. And he followed her home from school and dragged her into a field behind several homes and slit her throat and then sat on her and sat on her for over an hour, watched her bleed to death, and when he was convinced that she was dead, he left the scene. And she had the courage to stay alive and to drag herself to the nearest neighbor's house. Good fortune, I guess, too. And that, <laughs> I mean, but she was just, they had both been at school participating in extracurricular activities. She was walking home at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. I mean, could have been right. any one of our daughters. She survived. She survived. And what happened to the boy? I don't know, but I do know that his uh, sentence was extremely lenient. I, I will say this. He went back to high school. He went back to their high school. And she and her family had to move from the community. And I've heard this over and over and over again, that well, it's the blame the victim mentality, uh, right? We have teens on our own teen task force that we've worked with for years who, you know, a lot of times they get seduced, and I don't necessarily mean sexually, but seduced by these, you know, these very, these great guys. who Charismatic. Are big, charismatic, yeah. the big men on campus, the football stars, the basketball stars. And when they come forward and tell their stories of the abuse, these girls are ostracized from the community. Um, the same way a domestic violence victim is asked to leave her home has to you know has to leave her home to preserve the safe her safety and those of, and that of her children. That's why it's so critically important to educate the educators yep. to make sure that girls or boys and we'll talk about that in a yep. moment who do come forward are supported yep. and aren't blamed for the actions of another individual because you're right it's often the popular kid yep. who engages in this kind of yep. behavior and the girl who gets blamed for it which is just absurd or the victim gets blamed for it. You know, some people might hear that story as gruesome and horrifying as it is and say, oh, well, that's an isolated incident. I mean, how often does that happen? And Jane, I saw your eyebrows <laughs> go up when I said that, but I think some people might believe that. No, no, unfortunately, it's true. They, they do, but it happens, it happens so much. And it happens, you know, that's a very severe case, but it, but things like that happen all the time to these kids. And, and you know, you start to talk about technology and the role that technology plays. And, you know, if you think about the texting and the IM and the social networking and, and all the things that, that kids experience in school today with, with their friends, with their boyfriends, and how the digital world has really impacted the ability of one to, to um, perpetrate abuse against another, it's, it's amazing. We'll talk about that. How has technology made this more ubiquitous? It's instant. And it's everywhere. And, and it's constant. So it's, it's instant, it's constant, and it's everywhere. You can, you can blanket a school with the push of a button. You and can ruin one person's reputation with the push of a button. Yep. So the abusers are using technology to stay in constant contact and really to virtually harass mm -hmm. his or her victim, correct? Correct. And I think it's the same w as with adult victims. Mm -hmm. When a girl decides she may want to leave a relationship, that's one of the most dangerous times for her, and that's the time when the response is going to be the most abusive mm -hmm. and the most hurtful. And that's why girls, and as you said, in some cases boys, end up literally having to leave their schools. And for those of us who've raised kids, we know how traumatic an experience that is. You leave your entire community right. behind. Meanwhile, when you talk about technology, it's so secretive. You know, when I was growing up, my parents would know if a guy was calling me incessantly on the right. telephone, right. would come into my room and say, what in the heck is going on? Right. You know, why is this person calling at all hours? Why is he trying to stay in constant contact with you? But the way communication is nowadays, 
kids can be in their rooms under their covers with their cell phones or right. their computers Precisely. and be in constant communication and their parents could com be completely clueless about it. And they are. <laughs> in fact, <laughs> know they parents are. are shockingly clueless. I mean, I have a statistic, Jane. Your study, the Claiborne study, shows how out of touch parents are. They say 58% could not correctly identify the warning signs. Right. Of, uh, But, you know, I'm not surprised because it seems like the warning signs are pretty hard to identify and they must vary greatly from incident to incident, no? Uh, I mean, everything is going to, everything's going to be incident dependent, but, you know, the signs are, first of all, the signs are pretty typical signs that your kid's in trouble. You know, right. isolation from the family and friends, change in behavior, change in dress, dropping out of activities, um, especially when you're Poor talking grades. about, when you're talking about, right, yeah. when you're talking about relationship violence, you know, do well, they Well, you heard see, that girl say she didn't want to go to school, she right. didn't want to go to right. her job. They seem jumpy and nervous around their partner. Do they do they feel like they have to instantly respond to their partner on a text or an IM? You know, so th they're there. Um, you know, is it always going to be relationship abuse? Could it be some other bullying issue or something? Sure, but they're classic signs that there is something going on. And, you know, and then you can put on top of that unexplained bruises and, you know, turtlenecks in the summer and all the things that, that people do to kind of hide the fact that they're being physically abused. Well, and, uh, and on the parents issue, I think this is really, really critical. If parents come together and, st and talk to one another about not only what are the signs, but what are we going to do to hold kids and other parents accountable? Mm -hmm. How are we going to work together to prevent this in our schools and in our communities? I, I, that, I think that would go a long way. And there's a whole issue of, of sort of plausible deniability involved in parenting these days, which is, a, is, is really a side issue where people refuse to believe that their children, sure. not my kid, right. would well, ever be involved whatever. in that kind of behavior. And that's what we saw. You know, parents say, yes, this is going on, not my kid, but it's happening in the, in the community. But, you know, a lot of it has to do with parents being parents. You know, pe uh, th th there seems to be a generation who wants to be their kid's friend and the cool parent and the place where everyone comes to hang out. But it's about setting limits. There's no reason for a kid to take their cell phone into their room. You know, theoretically, once they're in the house, there's a phone that they can use. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, or, or, you know, at 9 o'clock, you turn it off and you have to give it to your parents. You know, there are rules that you can set. I mean, right. I already said my kids are little, but I already said to my husband, you know, we will not have computers in their rooms. You know, you have to have a public space. You and I don't think anyone has ever contemplated that, you know, we should not have computers in our kids' rooms or right. that our kids should turn I'm over their cell I'm feeling very phones. guilty right now because my daughter <laughs> has a laptop that she has in her room. And I, I have talked to her about it yeah. after a certain time of night saying because she has problems sleeping which yeah. I think is actually exacerbated yeah. by using the computer late at night but but how so I, I just want to make it clear to parents listening to sure. this hopefully there will be some out there and so warning signs again I think it, it, it's worth repeating them sure. Jane so so you would say isolation jumpiness as you said it, especially around their their partner if they especially if they see their nervous some, yeah around around that person or or the instantaneous need to return the text or return the call because as we, we started to say before they're using cell phones to check up on their their boyfriends and girlfriends so right, they as we be, saw in the piece why aren't right, you calling me right, where are you 30 right. times an hour you know yeah. not how are you but where are you who are you with what are you doing um, if they see so if they see their kid being really attentive to their cell phone in a in a, in a strange way, um, dropping out of things that they used to do, disinterest in activities that they used to. So be major really change in behavior, yep. right? Yep. Not feeling it's, safe at school. Right. It's very obvious. I mean, the parents that we've talked to, and we've talked to a lot of parents um, of kids of of people who've lost children, like Ann Burke, who is part of our organization called MADE, Moms and Dads for Education to Stop Teen Dating Abuse, and others who say that it was very obvious that there was something going on. And yet when Anne went to try to find help, mm -hmm. you know, all the professionals sh the help and the counselors she spoke to thought, oh, Lindsay's having a drinking problem, is she doing right. drugs? Right. It, they just, it wasn't even it wasn't in their really mindset yep. that this could be going on. But that's changing a bit. It has to be if many of these schools are mandating healthy education classes, right? I think it's starting to change, but I think, you know, it's very hard still to get these education programs into the schools on a regular basis. Um, a lot of times, you know, there's still this, this stigma around the issue, of course, and this idea of the administration that if we teach about this, it means we must have this problem. And our school is a nice school. We're a good school, and we don't have this problem in our school. 
And so it's, you know, a lot of stuff, exactly, a lot of work, a lot of um, awareness, things like what we're doing now to teach people about, you know, how these things come about and the idea of power and control and that we just need to help kids realize what the signs are and, where, and that there's help is so important. Uh, we have a question from, from Twitter, and that is, what do you think is the most overlooked cause of the violence as in a warning sign not noticed by the victim? Well, I think it's the, I think you said it earlier, it has to do with the seductiveness, the charismatic approach that a boy may have. The popular person who um, she starts not trusting herself as opposed to not trusting. Sort of loses her, her identity yes. because she so wants to please him because mm -hmm. she yep. feels somehow privileged and honored yep. that he has picked her. Yes. And, and if you think about it, you know, you're 15, 14, 16, it's very mm -hmm. hard to know what a healthy relationship is or isn't. And that's a big part of the problem as well. Well, I, I was curious how many of these abusers, and I don't know if you guys have done research into this, come from abusive homes themselves. Because I was struck by Tina, whose mm -hmm. name we changed mm -hmm. for her identity, mm -hmm. for her safety, um, saying that you know she accepted this treatment because her aunt had an abusive boyfriend. So how many of these victims and perpetrators grow up in an environment of abuse and they're just continuing the cycle? I think that's probably at the root of the cause. In so many communities, kids grow up just watching violence. It is the norm. Mm -hmm. We had a conversation with a group of teenage girls recently, and they said that, that it didn't occur to them that they shouldn't be treated that way. And one of the other things that didn't occur to them is that rape was abuse because it happens to everybody. And so, you know, that kind of life experience is extremely, um, I think it, it shapes their attitudes. But also, if you grow up watching uh, your parents fight, it affects your development. And what we do know, unfortunately, is that a number of young people uh, go on to perpetrate violence if they grow up in violent homes. And so the best prevention is modeling and living healthy relationships ourselves. Can you, can you turn that around though? Let's say, you know, can you, can, will education kind of turn that on its ear, this whole kind of conditioning mm -hmm. to accept abusive behavior? You know, that's the hope. I mean, the hope is to teach these kids when they're young and starting to enter relationships, you know, to at least question what a healthy relationship is, to at least question if this is making me feel bad, maybe it's bad. Yeah. Um, you know, right before we sat down, I, someone sent me information that in the UK they have just mandated um, education on, on dating relationships starting at age five. Really? From five to fifteen. Does that seem early to you? No. Really? Because you know, actually, can talk about dating relationships. Age five. <laughs> what do you talk about at you five? You talk about healthy relationships. Healthy relationships. Healthy, relationships. healthy, relationships. healthy you know, friendships. How people right. should treat each other. Exactly. Yes. Conflict yeah. resolution. Yeah. And, and how you know what? I wouldn't what? want my daughter dating at five. I know. <laughs> my I son was feel actually engaged with that. at five, but I think they're over it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Over That's it. true. I had my first boyfriend right. at five. His name was Matt Foley, and we made out during a film strip. At five? Yeah. I know. Anyway, <laughs> moving along. What about the role that other kids can play in terms of helping? Because I know there's so many really exciting peer-on-peer -peer programs mm -hmm. that are going on in low socioeconomic neighborhoods yep. and in upper-class yep. areas as well. Older teenagers, I think, can be extraordinary mentors, yep. especially if they're taught how to mm -hmm. mentor younger kids. I think I mean, before my 13-year-old niece is going to come to me for advice, she's going to go to a girl in high school. Yep. And, and I think that's what, what I was getting at earlier when we, I said we really need to engage teens more in the solution and in prevention and intervention. And I think it's boys and girls de demonstrating healthy relationships, yep. talking with one another about what that looks like. One thing you mentioned, boys and girls, because uh, I got many comments after this piece ran uh, that said, you know, sometimes boys are victims too, and why didn't we mention that? Mm -hmm. And I think that was a valid criticism, Absolutely. quite frankly. Mm -hmm. How often are boys victimized in this way? Because women taught to be equal uh, can sometimes be as aggressive sure. as boys. Yep. I, I mean, I think boys are, are victimized far more than they're willing to come forward. I mean, if you think about how hard it is for a girl to come forward and say that I'm the victim of, of this kind of abuse, well, you can only imagine, you know, it, it, what a boy would feel like. It's maybe, it's, you know, he feels like his, any kind of manhood is totally being questioned. Um, I think it's happening a lot. I think it's certainly happening in an emotional way. 
Um, and I have to wonder, then, does it extend to the physical? And we had, you know, Catherine and I have talked about this a little bit before. You know, I, I think there's also this notion for boys is that they're taught not to hit a woman, you know, theoretically. So if they're being attacked, I think it's a little bit hard to know mm -hmm. what to do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a way to defend, of course, but I, I think that I, it's something that I'm particularly interested in, in probing more. I don't think our culture is quite there yet, ready to, to welcome boys, mm -hmm. more boys coming forward. But certainly emotional harassment probably exists where a girl yep. is sort of technically or technologically on some guy's case 24-7. Sure. Uh, who's very possessive and jealous mm -hmm. and constantly bombarding him with text messages too, I imagine. Text messages or, I mean, destroying property or talking about him to his friends. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, Ruining it, his it, reputation. Ruining, yeah. So it's, it can go it both can. ways. Absolutely. I just wanted to point that out. In fact, another Twitter uh, question said, is violence against boys underreported and is there a gender stigma tied to reporting female on male assault, which I think you guys just answered that question. Um, what about the role the Rihanna Chris Brown incident played in at least raising consciousness about that, this whole issue, and the surprising, somewhat surprising reaction by some teenagers to the whole incident? Can we talk about that? Sure. Yeah. Uh, um, I think the the incident itself was a, a presented and unfortunately presented a very teachable moment and, a, and an opportunity for schools and parents and all of us involved in this issue to, to, to raise our hands in a much bigger way and start to talk about these issues. The reaction of girls, however, um, to blame Rihanna was a, was a, a, a huge reinforcement of the stigma that exists in our culture, this victim blaming. You know, again, I, I always say, you know, people are constantly asking the victims, you know, why did you stay, versus asking the perpetrator, why are you treating this person this way? Why are you abusing the person? And I think that was a really, a, a, a perfect example of that. Um, the girls blamed her. Um, she must have, I heard girls myself, she must have started it. She must have done something. She did start it. Well, I mean, that's right. what they right, were saying. Right. I mean, it's like, right. it <laughs> had to have been Wasn't hurt. that the report? I mean, again, I, I, that, that she, he got some text message mm -hmm. or call from an old girlfriend. She got angry and was initially physical herself. And so I think that's why some people had a hard time. I don't think anyone justified the violence that he was responsible right, right. for, but it did seem to get a little murky in there, didn't it? I think it's, I mean, part of the problem with these issues generally is that it's always murky. You know, I mean, the only people that really know what goes on is the two people that are involved. And I think, you know, unlike drunk driving or, or uh, any kind of disease, mm -hmm. you know, where you can ask somebody to go get this test, you know, it's, it's people and it's murky and it takes a long time to disentangle from these relationships. And it's, it's very hard. It's what makes this issue so hard. Um, but, you know, one thing that I said to this group of girls that I was talking to is like, let's say she did start it and she hit him first. He has a choice right then and That's there. And his choice is to stop, to, to not hit her back. You know, I mean, he can stop the car. He right. can get out. He could call the police. He could do 18 different things that don't include right. beating her up. Right. And sort of the proof is in that mugshot right. where she was obviously, her face was severely beaten as a result of this incident. But do you think that, in, in a, I mean, obviously it was a terrible thing for, for her and, quite frankly, for him, I think, although... It remains to be seen if it's going to have an impact one way or the other on his career. But do you think it did bring more attention to this issue? Certainly. Didn't the calls to the mm -hmm. teen helpline go up? Yeah. Way up after this. I mean, I think we, yes. It brought more attention, but I think that the murkiness of it, you know, it's, it's a little bit, on. It, it brought a lot more attention, a lot more awareness, and certainly, you know, probably to parents, which is really helpful, mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. it will then allow them to realize that this is an issue when they talk to their kids about drugs and sex and drinking. Oh, you know what? This is something else I probably should talk to my kid about. Yeah, right. definitely. Right. I know I did. Right. Every time I do a story on anything, like, you know, taking Adderall to do sure. better on a test, I come home <laughs> right. and I say to my kids, okay, we have to talk about this. Of course. <laughs> right. But, you know, I and mean, hopefully other parents feel the same way. In fact, uh, another Twitter question asks, are young men who must meet a parent especially a dad, maybe with a shotgun, right. just kidding, before dates begin as likely to act violently. Uh, so in other words, if you meet, if you meet the parents, um, do you think that that is helpful in a situation? I, I would have to say yes, obviously. Anytime, 
I mean, maybe mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. No, right. it doesn't help. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, no, I'm wrong they're about very that. Very charming. Yeah, I mean, they're a lot of times these guys are very charming and accepted into the families, and that's part of the problem for these young women to come forward is that because these the parents become, often like him. Sure, exactly, sure. and they, they and they the say, "What's the matter with you?" I mean, it 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 does flip back. And on they probably like women. the fact that the girls are being wooed or their suitors are highly, you know, yeah, popular, sure. high achievers, whatever, right? Exactly. Kind yeah. of BMOCs. Yeah. It would be nice if that was a preventative kind of thing where meeting the parents really made a difference, but uh, I don't yeah, think. That's interesting because I would have thought it would be helpful and to be a less, to have a less secretive relationship, but mm, yeah. as you said, One of the, the families case. that lost their daughter, um, in Maryland, um, they she was killed by her boyfriend three weeks after her college graduation, and he there they have pictures of from college graduation. You know there he is having celebrated it with them. Um, you know they didn't know him that well, but he was invited to right. to participate. And Are so, the perpetrators? Do they have obviously they have some emotional and mental issues? But is there a profile other than somebody who's popular and charismatic and charming that? If somebody like that goes out with my daughter, I can be kind of on the lookout for certain things, signs in the in the perpetrator, sure. not in the victim. Well, I think I think it's her gut that really matters the most. She probably is the person who knows best. And I think one of the things that we are most intrigued by right now in our work is what we're calling differentiation because there isn't one type of perpetrator of violence against women or one type of mm -hmm. perpetrator in an intimate partner violence situation because we all grow up with very different life experiences. Mm -hmm. But it does run the gamut of the continuum that we talked about. And we are we have to learn more about that and there is research that is starting. Do you that. think more states, Catherine and Jane, will adopt sort of what Ann Burke did in Rhode Island in terms so. of mandating healthy healthy relationship classes. I think so, Ohio just did. Um, and that's what we're working with these moms and dads around the country to, and working with the National Foundation for Women Legislators to try and get all these states to realize how important it is to um, educate these kids, you know, from middle in middle and high school every year so that they have some basis. You know, education really, back to your point earlier, is the best way to break the cycle going forward. We yep. want to help whoever is obviously in a situation now, but what you really want to do is prevent it. And so through education, if you can teach a kid what it looks like to be in a healthy relationship and to teach her to trust her gut, that if it feels wrong, it is wrong, wrong. Yeah. you can go a long way. Yeah, and, and to always kind of do constant gut checks because I know some of these things happen slowly and insidiously. Yeah. So it's like, it's not at first you're like, oh, what, what the heck is going on? Right. It's sort of these small incremental yeah. changes and warning signs that don't feel right. And you have to be very aware of those and really listen yep. to your heart in those areas, I think. Yep. Um, I mean, well, if she starts blaming herself for things that he's doing that hurt her, Right. That's a problem. a problem. All right. Well, hopefully we've educated some kids and some parents and hopefully mm -hmm. some school teachers and administrators <laughs> and health professionals yep. who I hope maybe you'll reach out to health teachers all yep. across the country. And yes. I'm sure you do that already, right, Jane? Yeah. <laughs> yes. And we're working through the CDC with a whole online teacher training module that will launch in February. So, oh, great. Which will be, you know, again, it's all free. And the more free stuff we can offer, the better, because then as the mandates come, they don't have to, they can't say, oh, we can't afford it. <laughs> yeah. Well, Jane Randall and Catherine Pierce, thank you so much for coming in and mm -hmm. helping us educate the public. And thanks for all the great work that you've done in this area. Thank you thanks for your terrific. attention to this. Thank really. you. Now, if you or someone you know has been the victim of dating violence or domestic abuse, reach out to one of the hotlines or websites you see on the screen right now. Tell a friend, tell a teacher, or tell your parents. Meanwhile, thank you so much for watching, and now stay tuned for a message from our sponsor, Dove.